When you have many objects that need to communicate together, you may end up having a lot of dependencies and this problem can be solved using the mediator pattern. Mediator is like the control tower at the airport. The pilots don't communicate with each other because they would need to know about all of the airplanes near the airport and would need to agree on who is going to land first. So instead they ask the control tower which tells them where and when they can land with the plane. The example that we'll be working on could be used in some multiplayer turn-based game where you have multiple players playing at the same time and you need to manage their turns. So when a player finishes his turn, he's going to contact the mediator, he will tell it I finished my turn and the mediator itself is going to choose who the next player is going to be, this way the players don't need to know about each other. My scene setup is really simple, I have those 5 players, they are all just copies and they have the sprite and then finally collider on the parent, that's it. So now we can get to creating some of these scripts. And we'll start with the I player mediator and the player. Both of these are going to be abstractions, so the I player mediator would be an interface or abstract class with the player the same way, that's really up to you. For now, the mediator interface will have two functions so that we can unregister the player and that we can request next turn from the player. The player class is going to have one variable for the mediator because each object through which we want to be mediating should hold a reference to the mediator so it can send it some request. Then we should also be able to start the player turn which is going to be called from the mediator and on destroy I am unregistering the player so I am also checking whether the mediator is null. In the case that it is null we cannot really unregister the player. Let's now get to the concrete implementations of the player and the player mediator. I created those two new scripts, we have the player controller AI and the player mediator. So the player mediator will be implementing the I player mediator interface, it's going to have the request next turn function and the unregistered player as well. And the player controller AI is going to be able to start the player turn. The mediator should be holding the list of the objects that it will be mediating through. So in this case we'll assign all of the players in the inspector, we should also be holding the current player which is currently playing and inside of the awake function we can just initialize that. So I'm going through all of the players and making sure that we assign the player mediator and then if we have more players than just zero we are going to assign the current player and start the player's turn. So right from start the first player should have already started the turn. So back in the player controller AI I've already added the logic to start the player turn I am adding some delay to make sure that the turn doesn't just end instantly. So I'm calculating some random delay, then I'm awaiting the delay. So for this I had to make the function async so we can wait inside of it and needed to add the using system threading the tasks. If the application is not playing after the delay we should just return so that we don't get any unity editor errors. Then we can simply move which is only going to calculate some direction and then increase the position by the direction. And after we move, we should also request next turn from the mediator. So this way the player is not really coupled to any other player. It doesn't know which player is going to play next. Maybe if there is only one player, it will actually be this player again that is going to play the next turn. And this is the main idea of the mediator, that the mediated objects, so in our case the players, can send some requests, but they don't know how they will be handled or who is going to receive them. After the player has finished his turn, he's going to request the next turn from the mediator. Here I'm checking if there are some players, then I'm getting the next player index. So we are getting index of the current player, adding one and using the module operator. This is making sure that we are looping through the list and that we don't go out of the bounds of the list. Then we can assign the current player and start the player turn of the next player. And finally, we can also complete the implementation for the unregistered player function. So if the list contains the player, then we can just remove it. In Unity, we don't need to do much. We should add the player controller AI script to all of the players. So I'll just drag it in. And then we can add new object, which will be for the mediator. Add the script there and drag in all of the players. So I will lock the inspector and drag them all at once. As we play the game, we can see the players are playing their turns. They are waiting for the each player to finish. And yeah, we can see that everything is working. Let's now take a look at how we can send some messages between the players. So we can either send message just to one player or to all players, maybe just to the enemies, to the friends and so on. This is what's also quite often done with the mediator. So let's go back to the code. 
in the iPlayer Mediator, I have added two functions. We can notify one player, so we're going to specify the player, pass in the message, or we can notify all players. Then in the Player Mediator, I have added those functions. I've added one helper function, which will allow us to notify players in a list. This will be used later in case that we want to pass in some custom list of players we want to notify, so that we don't have to be calling the notify player function on each of the players. We can simply pass it into the player list, pass in the message, which is going to loop through all of the players, and make the player receive the message. When we are notifying all of the players, we can actually utilize that function, so we notify players in the list of the players, which is containing all of the players, we pass in the message. When we are notifying a player, we will notify just that player we want. Here you can notice that I am using the receive notification function, which I've also added into the player. This is an abstract function, so it can be overrided. And back in the player controller AI, we are overriding it, so that's really quite simple. We just get the message, and I'm doing some debug.log to know that this player has received some message. And the receive notification function, you can really make it work in any way that you want. So maybe you would want to pass in an enum that would tell it some action it should do. Based on that enum, you would go through some switch statement and decide what to do. Or you may want to pass it some delegate, which will directly point it to some action that it should trigger. There is really tons of possibilities that you can do with these notifications, the requests and so on. But the way that we'll utilize it right now will be just when the player turns stars. It's going to send him a notification saying that your turn has started. So back in the player mediator, it should be quite simple. In the request next turn function, I'm checking if we want to notify on next turn because it can be a bit annoying having too many debugs. So I've added the simple boolean for that so that we can turn it off if we want. And yeah, if we want to be notified on the next turn, we can just call the notify all players function and say that that his turn has just started. So we can see player AI, player AI 1, 2, 3 and 4 all receive the same message that the turn of the player 1 has started and the same way for all of the other players. But now we are notifying all of the players so this is not that we always want to do. Let's say that we want to notify only the players that are close enough to one of the players to be attacked. So we'll check for the distance and then we'll notify only the players that are in the distance. To do that, in the player controller AI script, I've added a variable for the attack range. And then below, I have function that's going to get us all of the players in the attack range. So it's going to return a list of players. We are doing simple raycast, going through all of the hits of that raycast, checking if the collider has the player component and if the player is not equal to this. Because usually, we don't want to notify ourselves that we are in our own range, which would be in each case. And if that is true, we can add the player into the player's list to return that. Then below in the function notify enemies in range, we are getting the players in the range, going through all of them and notifying each of the players who is currently in the range. And then back in the start turn function, when we move, we can also notify the enemies in range. We can see the debugs are being quite annoying, so I will just disable the ones that are on the start of each turn and let's see now. So yeah, now we can see that two of the players have been notified and another two. I will just delete the debugs for now. Let's try once. Yep, so this player moved and it notified this player, so only one player. Let's try one more. This player moved, so it was in the range of those two players. It notified two of them, so player four and three. As we can see, player four is this one, player three is this one, and this is the player that moved. So this is an example of how we can notify players that are close to one of the players. Another thing we could try to do is that we would have those two groups of the players that would be kind of friends together and they would not be notifying each other about being in the attack range because the friends do not be able to attack each other but when they get close to some of the enemy players they should attack them. First we would need to decide where could we store the list of the friends. At first I thought that I could store it inside of the mediator but the mediator itself should not really be holding any data that's related to the players because the mediator's role is only to receive some requests and then pass them further to one of the other players. So when working with the mediator pattern, you really have to be careful to make sure that your mediator object doesn't become the god object. What is the god object? Well, it is just trying to do too many things at once, so it is also violating the single responsibility principle. So for this reason, we should be storing the friends of the player inside of the player itself. 
so either in the player or in the player controller AI. I've added a list of the players, which are the player's friends, and then I have those two public booleans which will just return us whether the player is a friend or is enemy of some other player. In the player mediator interface, we can now have the function to notify the player enemies, so we need to know the related player, so the enemies of which player do we want to message, and then optionally we can also pass in the list of the players to choose from. If we don't assign this, we should be choosing from all of the enemies of the player, but if we assign something, for example the players that are only close to the player, then we only want to choose the enemies from the close range. I have implemented the notify player enemies function into the player mediator script, so we are only going through all of the players, and if the players to choose from is equal to null, then we want to loop through all of the players. Otherwise, if we have assigned some list of the players we want to be able to choose from, we should be choosing from the players to choose from list. If the player is the enemy of the related player, then we can send the notification. And finally, in the player controller AI script, we can change the notify enemies in range function to call the function notify player enemies in the player mediator, which is going to pass this. So the enemies should be related to this player. We'll send the message and the players we want to choose from should be the players in range. So this should limit the players it's going to notify to the players which are in the range of this player and only to enemies of this player. And so that the player actually has some enemies, we should assign them somewhere. So I'm doing it just on start, that on start we check the distance from all of the players around us and if they are too close, they become our friends. So we have the function assign friends, where we are getting the players in range, looping through all of them and adding them into the friends list. And also I'm notifying each of the players just to tell them that we are now friends. So we can see that the notify player functions and all the other functions we made are really reusable and you can use them for pretty much any purpose. As we start the game, we can see that we have gotten quite a lot of notifications from the players. So those three players should be friends together and those two should be friends as well. We can see that we have gotten eight notifications, which if we count it makes sense because this player has sent a notification to this player and this player. So we have two notifications. This player sent again another two notifications, so that's four. This player again sent two notifications, so we have six. And those two players each just sent one notification, so a notification makes sense. So we can clear it and if we keep the game playing, we can see that we are not getting any more notifications because first I've turned off the notifications on each turn, but the players are not notified about being in each other's attack range if they are friends. So all of these are friends, they are not being notified. And if you would move them, so let's say that I can move this player here, those two players should receive the notification that some enemy is in their attack range. Yep, first this player moved, so only the one enemy received the message. You can keep it further. And now as the one enemy moved, both of these other players received the notification. We can try to mix the players even more to see that we'll get even more messages. So if you put them at the same place, we should see quite a lot of notifications about the players that are in the enemies at the range. Yep, and we can see that it is clearly working. This was just a simple example of how we can use the mediator, it can really be used for any kind of object or any kind of group of objects and you can see that it's really going to make the communication between them easy because the objects itself may not know about each other. To wrap it up, what are the pros and cons? Well, the pros of the mediator are that it's going to reduce the dependencies, you are going to have a centralized control over everything that's happening. This can be positive and also negative because if the mediator itself has some bug inside of it or some error, then everything is going to break. But I think that this is better than having errors in multiple different places. So you have centralized control. Everything is being controlled from one place. It's also following the single responsibility principle because each of the players only care about themselves. They care about what they do, how they move, how they attack. They don't really care about who is going to play next and so on. That's what the mediator is for. Also, it's following the open closed principle so that we can simply scale it because the mediator is following the interface so we can include more different types of the mediator and the same way the players are also following the same abstract class. So later we could add some player controller 
which would be actually for live humans who could play the game and we could also have some AIs as well. And the main disadvantage of this pattern is that the mediators have tendency to become god objects, meaning that they handle much more than they were originally designed for, but this can be avoided by careful planning, going through all of the logic once more and just checking whether it is not becoming the god object. And that's it, so I hope that I helped you to understand the mediator pattern and that you will know how to implement it in your own projects. Feel free to check out my Patreon where I'm releasing some extra content. Anyways, I hope that this video was helpful. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe and I will see you in next videos. Bye!